Hey, Ruben, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. I love that name, by the way, Ruben. Uh -huh. mm, I think if I ever have another child, if I'm crazy enough to have another child, I think it might make the shortlist. Huh. Nice. I, um, I love your About Me page, by the way. Yeah. What, what, what about About Me? It was different. You know, when you, you read an about me page, it's, it's almost like somebody has downloaded a template of how about me pages should be. Uh -huh. And you read them almost rote like, but when I read yours, it was funny, you know, saying about how you like were experimenting in the sixties. And then the next thing you know, you wake up and you're married and you've got kids and that kind of right. stuff. And I just thought it was a nice touch, Ruben. It made, it made, made me think, oh, this guy's human. I like that, you know, because sometimes when you're on the internet, you can't really get a flavor about how people are, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I have to go back and reread it. I haven't looked at it in a while. It was good. It was good. So let, let's start straight off the bat because I know we've only got an hour together. I have a community forum with a lot of people on there at the moment uh, who have just quit alcohol or are, are considering it or trying to, to quit alcohol. And the one thing that seems to kind of like be bugging them all is they've gone from a period of, I don't know, half decent sleep to non like to insomnia. They, they're really struggling to fall asleep. Why is that happening? Because they've quit alcohol. Well, well, first of all, when you say they've gone from a period of half decent sleep to really struggling with insomnia, you know, the picture I get is that they slid halfway down the hill and now they're sliding the other way. And the problem really didn't start halfway. It started before. In fact, there's, there's really interesting data survey data that shows that a little over 50% of adult alcoholics state that they started drinking in their teen years mm -hmm. primarily because they couldn't sleep, which is fascinating. Right. And it's true that, that uh, in the short run, in a very short run, alcohol can give you the impression that it's good for sleep. Mm. There's a little bit of alcohol that's so horrific, it'll help people fall asleep. In fact, there's an interesting parallel with cannabis, with marijuana. They're, they're mm. similar in that way. Um, it, it, so more and more people have, have been using alcohol for sleep onset. You know, there's the classic notion of, of uh, that, that shot at bedtime. Mm. And again, it will, it's so horrific, it'll help people fall asleep. But alcohol, as it burns off, as it, it's, it's digested, it creates what, what's called an adrenergic response. Um, because alcohol puts the brakes on and the body is always wanting to be in equilibrium. And if it feels that chemical applying the brakes, the body will put another foot on the gas pedal. Then what happens is when, when the alcohol is metabolized, the foot comes off the brake and suddenly we get this, this acceleration again, called an adrenergic surge is a release mm -hmm. of adrenaline. And that typically occur, occurs uh, hour and a half, two hours, two hours plus into sleep. And, and that, that extra energy that arises interacts with the normal energy in the first REM sleep, the first dream cycle, and typically wakes people up. If it doesn't cause a full awakening, it shakes up the quality of sleep, and it does so for the rest of the night. Because uh, I've, I've heard that before, that of, you know, having, a, having a drink before bedtime will help you somewhat, but this, the quality of your sleep is yeah. not as good as it, as you, as it is if you can try to get asleep sober. And that, that's what you're explaining, right? Absolutely, yeah. But we also have data that shows that, that when, when an individual is actively drinking at a, an alcoholic level, um, when they're in recovery, when they're new in recovery, and even years into recovery, they tend to, to have persistent sleep disorders, sleep problems. This has always baffled me. Um, I've been around 12-step programs for many, many years, uh, both formally and informally at meetings and also in, in uh, residential treatment centers. And it's striking to me, number one, how common it is that people mm -hmm. in recovery uh, have sleep problems. And number two, what's even more striking is how that is not addressed. And so when you step back and look at the situation, um, today, in the United States, more active alcoholics or alcoholics in recovery die from nicotine-related, from tobacco-related diseases than from alcohol-related diseases. And so this takes us back, I think, to the early days of the big book. Um, when, when all of that was, was being born, 
the only sleeping pill around or the category of sleeping pills were barbiturates. Mm. Barbiturates were, were intense and pretty nasty drugs, very easy to overdose on. There were numerous uh, accidental deaths associated with barbiturates, they're pretty dangerous drugs, and they're mm. hardly ever used now. So uh, I imagine when the big book was being, when, when, when the movement was being born, uh, there really wasn't a lot of choice for people in recovery who weren't sleeping well, and most of them were not. Uh, the choice was this, you, you take this damn sleeping pill, which is really dangerous, it's a heavy drug, or um, you muscle through. Mm. My theory is uh, the reason caffeine and nicotine historically have been so popular at 12-step meetings is that a lot of people in recovery, are, are even, even years into recovery, are not sleeping well, and um, they're using these substances during the day to counter their excessive daytime sleepiness. And let me say one more thing here. It's a shame. Uh, one, of the, one of the beauties, one of the many beauties, but maybe a core one in, in the whole recovery process is this understanding of the role of surrender. And, and it's not unique to 12-step programs. It's one of the contributions Carl Jung was involved in making. But, but this capacity to surrender and, and, and get that there's something, there's a higher power, there's something outside of me or my sense of self, that process in some ways seems simple, but that very process, that is at the heart of treating sleep problems. Uh, so, you know, the people in recovery are just an inch away from dealing with their sleep. And it, it's so consistent. It's so much a part of what the, you know is essential to recovery. So I, I I don't get I don't get why it hasn't caught on in treatment centers. Most treatment centers are giving people Benadryl, the alcoholics, the active alcoholics, Benadryl to sleep, or why it hasn't caught on. I've written about this and and for years, and it hasn't caught on in twelve step programs. People mm. need to. Sleep. Well, it's so basically what you're saying is then yes, there's evidence out there, and your experience shows that people when they quit drinking alcohol struggle to sleep, not just in the immediate aftermath, but many, many years later. And actually, there hasn't been sufficient enough investigation or research or any money put in that kind of area to discover why that is, right? Um, now, okay, so I get that. Let's well, talk no, about... We, we know okay. why it is. Okay, know, go on then. Yeah, so, so sleep gets thrown off pretty dramatically with alcohol. Uh -huh. I just, I just uh, recently, this in the past few weeks, uh, published a paper for the uh, Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, and it's called Dreamless, The Silent Epidemic of REM Sleep Loss. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing I talk about in that paper, so, so the essence of the paper is that we are not just suffering from lack of sleep. It turns out that most insomnia doesn't actually deprive us of sleep. M much of it does, but it deprives us more of dreaming. Right. And alcohol is, is an incredible, inter it incredibly interferes with dreaming. It does. It suppresses the dreaming of millions of people. And by the way, I, I'm not a teetotaler. I, I think for some people, a glass of wine with dinner, there's some evidence that that's fine. But that's mod, you know, real moderation with food, you know, where, where alcohol is driving one's life and not replacing spirituality. Mm. But uh, you might know this, 25 million Americans have an excess of 10 drinks a day. Mm. I mean, and that's toxic. That's poisonous. I mean, that, that's the, the peak of the iceberg there. But many, many more millions are drinking less, but still excessively. So anyhow, we, we are not just losing sleep. We're losing our dreams. And sleeping and dreams are so interlocked. Um, you, you can't sleep well unless you dream well. You can't dream well unless you sleep well. So alcohol not only damages REM sleep, it throws off circadian rhythms. It essentially... Uh, dislodges the whole sleep process. It, it changes it in the brain. And so even when we stop drinking, when we're in active recovery, that needs to be corrected. It's almost right. like a broken bone that doesn't heal properly. And being in recovery per se will not heal our sleep. We need to focus special attention on healing sleep and dreams. Are, are we saying then that the people who believe their sleep has got worse since they stopped drinking alcohol, are we saying that it's very likely that their sleep problems began when they started drinking alcohol anyway and there's, there's a little bit of bias there in as much as they think is are we saying maybe it's because they're more awake now because they're not the brain's not as foggy as it used to be because they're not drinking anymore 
that suddenly the lack of sleep that they used to have anyway is just more prevalent? It's just never been any different? It may well be that they're much more aware of it. Mm. And, and the primary symptom, I, I mean, aside from the obvious, when people aren't sleeping well, uh, they know it at night. But that symptom tends to be swept under the rug, you know? It's something we do uh, on our own. It's dark. It's night. We're in bed. Mm. We get up in the morning, you down some coffee, and uh, you know we, we come back to this waking world with you know millions of like walking wounded, you know, emotional mm. zombies who have not enough sleep. It's part of the culture. But the 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 most visible symptom of sleep disorders during the day is daytime sleepiness. And, and again, I think that drives a tremendous amount of dependence on caffeine and dependence on uh, well, high glycemic foods, sugary, starchy foods, dependence on drama. Um, you know, we, we unconsciously seek sources of energy to keep us awake or, or for many people, nicotine, tobacco. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two questions on that, if that's okay. Um, you said that it's not just alcohol is just not just robbing us of our sleep. It's robbing us of our dreams. Yes. Why, why are dreams important to sleep? Because I've never, ever thought about that before. Mm. Dream, dreaming. Um, this, this is my deepest concern in my professional life. It's my deepest concern as a person today is that there is an epidemic of dream loss. So, so let me just say something about what we know uh, about the functions of REM sleep and dreaming. Uh, and this is, this is data that's come out just in the last few years. Mm. Um, so when, when we dream, we are literally digesting waking life experience. You might know in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion of, of the human digestive system as a second brain. Yeah. We got a second brain. The reason for that, it started with the discovery of all the major neurotransmitters that occur in the brain, in the central nervous system, in, in the gut. So in fact, there's more serotonin in our bellies than there is in our brains. There's right. norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine. And um, it makes sense if you step back and you realize that your gut has to make some very important decisions. We send all kinds of stuff down there, right? You know, mm. the stuff that the foods and the fluids that we consume. And I mean, just a mix of a wide array of things. And so the gut has to decide, okay, we're going to, this is okay. We need this. It's nourishing. We're going to keep it. This is not so good. It's toxic. We're going to excrete it. So the gut makes those decisions about what, what it's going to keep and assimilate and make literally a part of who we are and part of our energy and what it will literally eliminate and mm -hmm. send to the toilet. Okay? So during REM sleep, during dreaming, the brain is a second gut. The brain during dreaming, the brain does what the gut does. So we consume lots and lots of experiences in waking life. When we're awake, the things we see, the conversations we have, what we read, what we think, what we feel during the day, there's really billions of bits of information coming into us. And the function, one of the functions of REM sleep is at night in dreaming, in, in healthy dreaming, metaphorically, the brain will chew on, swallow, digest, and sift through all of these experiences. And what, what the brain in dreaming decides to keep, it will then incorporate into our being. Now, the, the technical term for this is memory formation, but it's much richer than that. Uh, it, it, it changes who we are. So the Greek god of dreaming was Morpheus, uh, the root of the word morph. Dreaming morphs us. We grow in our dreams. We, we, we take in new experiences, new relationships, new emotions. And then there, there's, there's stuff that we don't need that is excreted. In, in this process, something else very important happens. Negative emotion is, is down-regulated, it's decreased. So if we had an encounter, um, something, something with a person, a bad experience, something that hurt us, an old memory, if there's negative emotion in the dream, it's normally, it's essentially therapized. We, we, we refer to the dream as endogenous therapy. So there's a, there's a, there's a down-regulating of emotion. So dreaming remakes us. Every day we change, we grow a little bit. It's not just, let's say you're sitting in a meeting and, and you know, you share a story or you hear a story and you get an insight. You know that feeling like, 
oh wow, and if you just feel it, that doesn't really become fully a part of who you are until it's processed through the dream. Right. It's processed through the dream. When we don't dream well, we experience what I call psychological constipation. We're not digesting life experiences. It's stuck. Another word for that is clinical depression. Everything just stops. We're not processing life. So in that sense, dreaming is critical. You know, from, from a, a health standpoint, we know that decrements or damage to our dreams is associated with memory loss. It's associated with dementia. It's associated with Alzheimer's disease. And it's associated with depression. So it's just really critical that we dream. So what are we doing that is creating this epidemic? I, I'm going to have a complete stab in the dark. I, I assume, listening to what you talked about, the gut and the brain, that environmental toxins, what we're eating, our, uh, electronic use, uh, am I on the right lines? I, I think that's a part of it. The, the, the biggest part of it, uh, the main reasons there's an epidemic of dream loss in our world today, uh, and not in any particular order, Alcohol, mm. marijuana, commonly used prescription and over-the-counter medications such as antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, benzodiazepines, if you're familiar with them, anticholinergic drugs, many cardiovascular medications, and lastly, but not least, sleep disorders. All of those factors diminish our dreams dramatically diminish our dreams. And there are likely other ones that we haven't studied. We know that EMFs, electromagnetic fields, for example, when they're close enough, they suppress melatonin in the pineal gland. Lower melatonin levels in all likelihood also decrease our dreaming. Light at night uh, suppresses melatonin, which decreases dreaming. When we awaken with an alarm clock routine, mm -hmm we're snipping off the end of our dreams because we do most of our dreaming in the latter part of the night. It's like somebody handing you a really good short story and saying, wait a minute, and then tearing off the last three pages. We never finish our dreams. Huh. If I may say, there's yeah. another, I think very critical to, to recovery work. There's another piece to dream loss. Um, there's a spiritual piece to it. So dreaming is not just this movie that we see at night in, in the dream the way that we see is exercised. So uh, the great philosopher Schopenhauer said, most of us mistake the limits of our own perception mm -hmm. for the limits of the universe. You know, if this mm -hmm. is what I see, this is all there is. Right. What dreaming does is it expands consciousness, you know, to use a term from the 60s. Dreaming exercises our ability to expand our view of the world. Today, most of us learn, most of us have developed what I think of as microscopic eyes. We're so interested in the details, you know. In, in science, we, we want to fill in the, the, the sort of missing pieces, right, uh, which is fine. But we, we lose the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. And that's the spirituality is the bigger picture. So when we lose our dreams, as in my article, I open with the Rolling Stones quote that says, lose your dreams and you will lose your mind. I think it's, it's quite literal. We really lose our mind. We lose our spirituality. So dreaming has been referred to as the language of God. And I think in our dreams, our, our dreams are personal dialogue with the spiritual world. Uh, we don't have to go through a middleman to do that, that we have, we have potentially direct access there. What is, um, if, we, if we are suffering this em epidemic of dream loss and it's so important to us on a spiritual level and a psychological and a physical level. What are some of the things that people can do to try to get their dreams back? I mean, we taught obviously quitting alcohol. I mean, you know, but what, what else could we, could, could happen? Right. There? So that question is critical and it, it can't be separated from the question of getting our sleep back. And the question mm. is how, how do we, how do we resume a healthy nightlife, meaning a night consciousness? How do we how do we restore healthy sleep? Right. So just just jumping in there, what you're saying is let's work on getting our sleep back, and if we get our sleep back, then our dreams will naturally follow. We'll come together. Right. Okay. Let me come at this circuitously. Mm -hmm. If you ask me what what is at least culturally or even spiritually 
the primary cause of all of this sleep and dream loss. It's something I call wake centrism. This is a term I, I've made up and I use in my writing. Wake centrism refers to this idea that we have a bias toward waking, ordinary waking consciousness. Um, we believe that waking is where it's at. The, the, there's a premium on it. And so there's three kinds of consciousness, obviously. There's waking, sleeping, and dreaming. Mm. But we look at sleeping and dreaming as being secondary and subservient. <laughs> yeah. Think about sleep and dreams. You know, I got to sleep well, so I'm, I'm a better waking person. Mm. I, I got to dream well, and I can, I can use my dreams. I can juice them and find out about my psychology and be a better waking person. Now, I'm not arguing against waking, but we've lost sight of, of this this unified broader expanse of consciousness of, of the who we are includes waking sleeping and dreaming and um the point i want to come to here is, is uh, i believe very firmly that we are as as a society addicted to waking life we're addicted right. to waking and uh, there's part of me that wishes that somebody would start a 12-step program for insomnia because insomnia is not um it's not that we don't have enough sleep that's the symptom it's that we have too much waking we 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 believe waking is where it's at we try to use the waking mind to do everything in fact we try to use the waking mind to get to sleep mm. the part of us that we call i right we all call ourselves i usually it's the ego or the waking self the part of us that we call i is incapable of sleep it just can't. It's the waking self. Mm. It, it can walk us to the edge of the waters of sleep, but it can't swim. And a lot of people get stuck right at that edge. You know, uh, it's like trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. bootstraps. And here's where surrender comes in. So uh, an essential part of getting to sleep is learning to surrender the waking self. Really learning to let that go, <clears throat> being willing to let that go. Now that's tricky. Um, Hypnos, the Greek god of sleep, uh, was brother to Thanatos, the god of death. And uh, in many sacred traditions around the world, th there's an understanding that the act of getting to sleep is a profound act of surrendering the self, which feels, can feel like a kind of dying. Mm. So the Dalai Lama, in fact, said that the psycho-spiritual process of falling asleep is identical to the process of dying. So it's gonna make a lot of people not wanna go there, right? <laughs> no, but it makes, it makes perfect sense, right? Because when people say they're afraid of dying yeah. and, and that leads them to drink, I, I often think, well, you kind of die every night. You, die. you, close, you close your eyes and, you, and, and to all intents and purposes, you're dead. You're not, you know what I mean? So and you're not afraid of going to sleep at night. Well, not everybody, but so- Wait. Waking self is dead. Yeah, I, I think what you just said then was uh, extraordinary for me. I've never heard that before, but it just makes perfect sense to me. And I guess I see this vicious circle as well, because if you suddenly fear going to sleep for whatever reason it could be, it could be um, I'm not going to get my stuff done because I have to sleep. Uh, it's a waste of time. I can sleep when I'm dead. All those type of things. I have to be awake. I'm addicted yeah. to sleeping. You're going to be stressed out, which is going to make it even more complicated for you to sleep. So I guess the million dollar question is, um, how, even knowing this, how do you then surrender? How do you, what is the process? And I'm pretty sure it's not a short term thing. How, what, what daily practices do we need to incorporate in our lives? to surrender yeah, so let, let me go back a step um mary oliver the poet has a an exquisite poem it's actually the best spiritual description i've ever witnessed of sleep the poem is called sleeping in the forest and she starts out by saying i thought the earth remembered me she took me back so tenderly and there's the sense of returning her body to the earth mm. so our addiction to waking, you know, I, I mean, one of the fundamental obvious differences between waking and sleeping that we never pay attention to is when we're asleep, we're horizontal. Mm -hmm. There's something humble. In, 
we're, we're all the same size in bed, pretty much, you know, we're just a few feet off the ground. So when we're asleep, we're horizontal. When we're awake, we're vertical. Um, that vertical wakefulness, that our addiction to waking, psychologically and spiritually, keeps us vertical. And um, the, the technical term we use for that is hyperarousal. And this is an important concept. Um, and in fact, it's related to why some people drink. Hyperarousal technically means that we are excessively awake. Now that makes, might sound nonsensical. People think people know that okay, I can I can sleep at different levels. I can be in light sleep, you know, moderate sleep, deep sleep. The truth is, we can be awake at different levels. You know, we can be groggy and kind of you know just languid and slow, easy wake, or we can be you know. Um, downtown Manhattan in the middle of rush hour, just buzzing, right? But in our world over the years, the standard for waking consciousness has metaphorically gotten faster, faster, and faster. In fact, if you listen to people talk in, in most places now, it's like AM radio, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. and so we are excessively awake. And this is a concept that, that is well-defined and well-measured. We measure it in terms of EEG, uh, waking is associated with what we call beta EEG. Many, many people are actually flying in high beta. They're, they're, the brain is buzzing, heart rate is up. It actually raises core body temperature a little bit, but a significant amount. Uh, it increases sympathetic nervous system reaction. So the way we do waking, it's high altitude waking, hyper arousal makes it hard. It's as if we are airplanes, but we're flying so high we don't have enough time to descend at night and then to land. And we also, because we go so fast, we need a longer landing strip. So that's hyper arousal. Hyper arousal keeps us from sleeping at night. I believe hyper arousal is one of the main reasons people start drinking. People, people self-medicate because they're buzzing and they don't know how to come down. Mm. Not surprisingly, the antidote to hyper arousal is humility. It's humility. So let me just share a story. I learned this from my dog many years ago. Uh, dogs in, in Jungian psychology, the dog is the archetype of humility. You know, dogs, I, in my experience, are the most humble creatures on the planet. You know, they're just so damn humble. <laughs> and so I'd be out in the backyard throwing Frisbee with my dog Isaac. He's a Siberian Husky. And I swear to God, the dog could fly. I mean, he just loved this. And he'd be impassioned and up there 20 feet in the air and just grabbing this thing. It was always like in slow motion. And, and then, then my cell phone would ring. And he'd look at me and I'd put the thing in my ear. And he'd give me one of those dog looks like. Yeah, oh, really? With Frisbee in. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but he learned, you know, I mean, you know, I'm on the phone. And then within, this is what blew me away. Within a few seconds, he was like a bag of bones on the ground and asleep. Mm. It just blew me away that he could be so impassioned, so aroused, so high, so awake, and then come down. And that's the humility of a dog. So I thought the earth remembered me. She took me back so tenderly. Um, the metaphor of sleeping on earth is actually, it's a metaphor of humility. The word humility comes from the Latin humus, which means earth. It's a returning to the ground. It's getting grounded. It's coming, coming down from the upper atmosphere of hyperarousal. And so um, toward the end of the poem, she says something that is just uh, striking. Um, she talks about, I slept as never before, a stone on the riverbed. And um, toward the end of the poem, she says, and I rose and I fell. And I rose and I fell as if in a luminous doom. She describes, as if in water, she says, she describes the sense of up and down. And what it reminded me of is that when we go to sleep, the first step is we need to return the body to the earth. It's a metaphor. We need to, we need, we need to allow the body to go down. The body goes down in sleep. We submit to gravity, which allows us to feel heavy. And, and, it, and it brings us down, we, we get horizontal. Uh, a lot of people struggle with that. The body gets innervated. Um, now there may be many things, including alcohol, but other substances and medications that keep the body buzzing, it keeps the body too hot. The body has to go down, it has to start to cool. 
In fact, our bodies beautifully do exactly what the world does. When the sun goes down at night, no matter where you are on the planet, temperature will gradually come down. It'll keep sliding downward until dawn, and then it'll come back up. Mm. Normally, naturally, when we put the body to sleep, body temperature continues to drop bit by bit through the night, it reaches its lowest point before the dawn, and then comes back up. People who don't sleep well, the body temperature doesn't do this, it does this, it stays flat. So we can say people who don't sleep well aren't very cool. Mm. Okay. Sleep well, you gotta be cool, but literally. But there's this whole process of putting the body to bed. It's like putting your pet to bed, you know, in a loving, compassionate way, making sure it's comfortable, making sure the room is cool, making sure it's dark. I rose and I fell. Once the body is comfortable, the metaphor, and this is true in spiritual traditions around the world, once the body is comfortable, the spirit rises. The body goes down, the spirit rises. The spirit rises into sleep and into dreams. I've got this uh, vision of my, my wife is very, um, she's very methodical, very slow, very deliberate. She's the type of person who's always last eating her food, getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll often have a go at her and say, when you hurry up, you know, and she looks at me as if to say, Lee, you've got it all wrong, man. And <laughs> she definitely can just fall asleep. Mm hmm yeah, you know, it's a beautiful example. Number one, does, does she not know that being like that is illegal in the United States? <laughs> no. <laughs> two, you know, some people, uh, like the example I gave with my dog Isaac, some people keep sleep nearby. They, they, they never get that far away from a state of peace. Hmm. It brings up a very important point. We've been taught that sleeping and waking are opposite, mutually exclusive conditions. And they're not. And, and today we have really good data. Uh, much of this comes from the study of Yoga Nidra, if you're familiar with that. Mm. And, and some of it from the study of mindfulness, long-term mindfulness meditators. It is possible, and we know for a fact, that you can actually be in deep sleep and be aware of it. Mm. Not easy to do because there is, from a waking perspective, there's nothing there. So awareness of sleep is what's called pure awareness. It's awareness of awareness. But it's so essential because we can actually learn to, ha to have elements of sleep. I, I, actually, let me go back a step before I say this. Um, what I've come to believe is that sleep is our default consciousness. And in our world, we're fond of saying and thinking, I'm going to sleep, right? It's like, I'm here and sleep is over there. Well, the truth is I can go to bed, but we never actually have to go to sleep because, and this is gonna sound silly, but I'm gonna say it, we are, all of us, always already asleep. Sleep resides inside of us. It is the foundation of consciousness. Uh, for example, if you're in a noisy room, um, you can't hear the quiet, right? But it's not like you have to go to the quiet. If you simply subtract the noise, the quiet is already there. Most of us live in this noisy waking. If we simply let go of waking, we never have to go to sleep. The sleep is already there. Sleep is our default consciousness. It's the foundation of who we are. It is a profound state of inner serenity. It's inner peace. We never have to earn it. It's been given. We just have to allow ourselves to receive it. I, um, I worked in the rail industry for 20 years. I left school when I was 16, joined the railroads, and I was there until I quit alcohol and was brave enough to quit. And I got myself into a position where I was two uh, steps away from managing director. So I had quite a lot of responsibility. Mm. And uh, I struggled to sleep. And I... I didn't realize how bad it was until the day I put my notice in and it was accepted and they immediately put me on gardening leave, which means I couldn't go back to work. They were like, yes, you can go, but you cannot come back to work. And that night, knowing that I would never, ever, ever, ever again have to set my alarm clock to wake me up, 
that nobody would ever ring me to tell me they trapped their fingers in a wagon door, that I would never have to listen to another person dying on the railway or another train being late. All of those thoughts. I slept like a baby that night. And ever since then, the only time I can't sleep is when I'm with sleeping with my one-year-old daughter in bed with her, or I have to get up for something. So I have to set my alarm to catch a train or a bus to do something. Then I'll struggle. So mm-hmm. that, that Ruben, got me to try to educate people uneducatedly <laughs> around sleep and, and alcohol stuff was, well, focus on what is it in your life that is like creating so much stress and anxiety and remove it. And when you remove it, a little bit like your metaphor about being in the room with the noise, then what remains is stillness and calm. Right, right. And that, I think that's the case in recovery process too. Uh, pe- people are encouraged to understand their own sense of higher power. And for many people, it, 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 one way or another, it has to become an experience. It's not just an idea. It's not something, something you read in a book or somebody tells you. It becomes an experience. And that's the case with sleep too. I really believe that that when we feel peace during the day, during waking, that to me is an expression of sleep. That's identical with sleep. We're part awake and part sleeping. Hmm. You said earlier on, uh, a long long time ago, right towards the beginning then, about people um, getting very sleepy during the day. Mm -hmm. Should people be having more sleep in the day? Well, it depends. Um, if somebody is not sleeping well at night, if they have insomnia, trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, we generally discourage napping during the day because mm. we want them to stay pretty sleepy as part of the process for overcoming their insomnia. But uh, otherwise, a, a nap during the day is really ideal. Um, usually we recommend uh, approximately 20 minutes, 25 minutes in the middle of the waking day and there's good evidence that that actually it improves somebody's mood, it decreases blood pressure, it improves creativity. Uh, Yogi Berra, the baseball player, used to say, "I take a two-hour nap every day from one to five. <laughs> so we suspect it also increases one's sense of humor, but that, that's probably excessive for most people. But a nap is a good idea. Again, it's a way of of weaving sleep back into the day. Uh, back back to your comments about your wife. My guess is that somehow, instinctively, intuitively, she keeps a quality of sleep nearby. She's never that far from it. She's also very into her dreams. Like she'll wake up in the morning and she will tell me her dreams. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're boring me, but she'll tell me her dreams. She believes they really mean something. She will Google them to understand what they are. Um, Whereas I'm a bit more like, Sleep is a pain in the ass. I like it when I'm sleeping, but I, I struggle to get there because I want to stay awake watching a movie or doing more work or something. So I, I don't think that is um, a coincidence. I think, like you say, when you start to really deeply think about this in a spiritual sense. And feel it. I feel, feel it is the right word, yeah. I'm always up here. Feel it, yeah. Perfectly. I can, I can totally get that. So my advice to people hasn't been that far off, right? So my advice to people, which has been very traumatic actually is look, if you want to sleep, change your job and find something that you love. Right. Um, now that is very difficult for a lot of people, obviously mindfulness meditation. Uh, I imagine long-term is going to really help. Uh, yes, definitely. What about what's your opinions on these things like melatonin supplementation um lots of different devices and stuff step with something you said that that you you tend to be in your thinking mind a lot and you'd rather watch a movie than sleep um what i hear is that you'd rather watch a movie than be in a movie because when you sleep and you dream well you're not just watching the movie you're a character in it Mm. Um, let me ask you. Let me ask you about that then. Is that if that's okay? Why? I used to. I had this time when I used to have very lucid dreams. So for people listening who don't understand what that is, I could control not everything in my dream. But here, here's what used to happen in my dream. 
one, I would know that I was in nightmare and I would scream and scream and scream to wake myself up to tell myself to get out of the nightmare. The other one that used to happen to me a lot, and this one still happens to a certain degree, is, is sexual dreams. Mm-hmm. Knowing that I'm in a dream of sex and trying to push myself to achieve orgasm very selfishly in my sleep. Mm-hmm. But today, other than the sex dreams, everything else has disappeared. I don't have those lucid dreams anymore. Why do you think? I, I, after talking to you, I think it's because my, uh, my, I'm, I'm going against my natural state of being. My natural state of being should be asleep. And I'm kind of like trying to bury that, trying to just keep this waking life top priority. Are you getting enough sleep? No. So the, the brain and the body prioritize sleep over dreams. Just, just as the brain and the body actually prioritize fluids over food, mm. if we're deprived of food, we can go for weeks, but you can't go without water for more than, say, three days. Um, so if you, if you don't have enough general time, you know, let's say you need seven hours and you're only getting six or you need eight and you're only getting seven, you're not going to lose sleep. Mm. You're going to lose dreams because the, the brain is hungry for the sleep. And, and So it's quite possible you're not getting enough dream time. Mm. That would affect the quality of your dreams, not just the quantity, but the quality. Okay. All right. That makes sense to me. So go back to the question that I jumped in on, on the melatonin stuff. Yeah. So, so number one, uh, alcohol disrupts melatonin. Melatonin is, um, is a very unique neurohormone. It's in the brain. It's in other parts of the body. It's produced by the pineal gland, which we associate with spirituality, the third eye. At night, when the retina, when the eye detects dimming light and then ultimately darkness, total darkness, it ramps up the production of melatonin. Melatonin is is kind of the queen of our nighttime physiology. It runs the night shift in the Mm -hmm. brain and the body. So it's much more complicated than sleep. It includes sleep and includes dreaming. So melatonin dilates peripheral blood vessels, all the vessels under our skin. It opens them up. What that means is that it cools us down because when blood comes to the surface, it releases heat, which is so essential. You know, we need to be cool at night, yeah? Mm. Melatonin also triggers a very complex cascade of changes in, in, in the brain, which initially triggers sleep, drops body temperature. And then when melatonin levels are peaking out, when they're at their highest, It's in the last third of the night. That's when we do most of our dreaming. So there's a strong correlation between high melatonin levels and dreaming. And here's the rub. Uh, I believe in our world today that the vast majority of us, I'm going to say 98% of us, are melatonin deficient. Why? Very simple reason. Even small amounts of light at night suppress melatonin. And most of us are way overexposed to light at night and the quality of the light at night. Um, So there are measures we can take to to filter light. Uh, I have a light on my desk. I don't know if you can see it here. Let me me bring it over. Um, Uh, Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of an orange light. Usually if I'm working at night, this is the only light that I'll have on. Um, It's called the low blue light. Right. Light bulb that filters out the blue wavelength. Most light, most screens have a lot of blue. Uh, Blue light, the blue wavelength specifically sends a message to the brain to suppress melatonin. So if we can get rid of blue light at night, we can wear blue blockers or have screens. Newer smartphones have programs that actually dial down the blue light. Um, There there is an app, it's, it's a free app available for computers that also dials down the blue light in the computer. Yeah, it's called Flux. I use it. Yeah. Flux. Flux. Yeah. 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 So th- these are all good things to do, and uh, the other the other option, of course, is to take a supplement of melatonin. Most people, I believe, who use melatonin are really misinformed about it. Hmm. Uh, most people I encounter take much too much melatonin, and they take the wrong kind. There are basically two kinds. There's regular release and time or sustained release. Um, the regular release formula is not the best to take on, a, on an ongoing basis. 
because melatonin has a short half-life. So it'll, it'll peak up, it'll spike, and then it'll come down in the first part of the night. And you don't want that. So a time release will stay present through the night. And melatonin, even small amounts, a half a milligram, a milligram of time release, will, for many people, help them get back in touch with their dreams. I'm going to try that. I'm one of these people where my, my wife used to take melatonin and she would suggest I take it before going to a flight or something. And I, I'm one of those people say, I'm not taking that rubbish. That's not going to work for me. You know, I'm, I'm the same with aspirin. If someone gives me something for my headache. So I think I'm going to try it and see uh, what happens. Well, the way I look at melatonin, I've, I wrote about this in my first book is that um, it's, it's not a medication. Mm. that it's actually, I, I write about what I call melatonin replacement therapy because we have unknowingly deprived ourselves of natural melatonin. Uh, for example, people who spend a lot of time indoors, which really is most of us, we're not exposed to enough sunlight. Mm. We don't get enough vitamin D. So it's, you know, we're not trying to boost anything. We're really trying to compensate for what we've lost in nature. Mm. Um, one of the best treatments, speaking of nature, one of the best treatments we have for insomnia um, is this very complex, high-technology treatment called camping. <laughs> oh, In the last couple of years, um, there have been a few studies where, where people were taken to the country. Now, we had to surgically remove their devices, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when, when, you, when you reconnect with nature, nature has such a profound effect on our circadian rhythms, changes in light and darkness and temperature and clean air, it really helps us. When we get back into that that dance with nature, it mm. really helps us sleep. I've got some questions here. One's from Susanna from Strive Community Forum. Susanna said, uh, since, since, as, since as a child, I've always remembered my dreams, except when drunk. Often some of, this, some of these seem to come true. So some of the dreams seem to come true at a certain level. Uh, it always seemed weird to me, to be honest. But the last year or so, the recurring dream is of me trying to leave a place, but something's preventing me from leaving there. My question would be if there's any substantial connection to our actual current situations and struggles with our dreams and how, if even we can translate that. I guess that touches a little bit on what you were saying earlier on about that kind of being that sponge. Well, that, that question has a lot packed into it. Um, first of all, let me comment on precognitive dreams. Um, I, I've, I've spoken and I speak about dreams uh, all over the world. And um, I, I'm always fond of asking a group of people, how many of you have ever had a precognitive dream? And, and people start to do this. The hand goes up and they kind of look around because they're afraid. <laughs> but generally speaking, about half the hands go up. Um, this is not coincidence. And, and, uh, and then I say, how many people have had repeated cognitive dreams? Half the hands go up. So this is a very common human experience. I think if more people paid attention to the dreams and had their dreams, almost all the hands would go up. It's not unusual. My, my dream teacher was uh, shamanic in orientation, and he taught us something unusual. He said, actually, he said life happens in the dream before it happens in, in what we call waking reality. Mm. It's a little bit like at night, if you're looking up at a star that's a hundred light years away, what, what we're actually seeing is no longer there. It's what happened in the past. By the time it got here, it had already happened. Mm. We it looks at the dream that way, that it's happening in this other larger sphere. And at night, we're in that sphere. Then when we wake up, uh, when that reality finally shows up here, we have deja vu where we dreamt about it as precognitive. It's not that the dream is precognitive. It's that waking is postcognitive. Right. That this is history. So that's one way of looking at it. The question of, of recurrent dreams is an interesting one because it's, it's, the dream is knocking on your door over and over and over again. And this is a dream that's worth paying attention to. How do we do that? Um, I, I, I'm reluctant to say, but I, I think most approaches to dream, dream work and dream interpretation are misleading. Uh, most dream interpretation takes a, a universal spiritual tenant and turns it upside down. And the tenant is, as it is above, so is it below. And in Western Judeo-Christian sp spirituality, we have this idea that there's this larger world out there. And then, you know, we're, we are 
were designed based on, on that template. So um, the, dream, the dream comes from a larger world, but most dream interpretation will look at an image or an experience from the dream and we'll, we will interpret it based on comparing it to the waking world as if it comes in. What that does is it downsizes the dream. It shrinks the dream. It's like, oh, I dreamt about an apple. And I look it up in one of these dream dictionaries under A, it says apple sex, right? Or I dream about a pen. And I look it up under P, it says pen sex. Mm. I dream about a telephone pole, phone sex. Mm. Yeah. Was, but, but those are silly ideas where we think we can understand the dream by comparing it to waking life when it's just the opposite. We'll have a better understanding of our waking life if, if we compare it to the dream. We want to let the dream expand our consciousness. We don't want to shrink the dream down to fit it into our waking lives. So let me give you a recent example. Mm -hmm which is, is important to me. I live uh, just a few steps from the Mexican border. And there's been a, a lot of discussion, of course, about, you know, build that wall. Mm. Uh, in, in dream work, uh, when we dream of something, when we in North America or uh, Europe, when we dream of something geographically from the South, when the Europeans would dream of Egypt, which was below, or we dream of Mexico or, or South America, Usually that the geography is a reflection of the depth of the dream. So my, my teacher was delighted if I dreamt about Brazil or Mexico. I was like, wow, this is a deep dream. Right. Um, and so in my work, in, in, in attempting to call attention to the fact that there's been a dramatic epidemic of dream loss, what that means uh, is that we've really cut ourselves off from deeper parts of ourselves. Right? Mm. And uh, in, in one respect, we've created a wall. So this idea of building a wall to separate North America from Mexico, I think is a symptom of a much deeper issue uh, that we've already built a wall that separates our higher waking self from the depth of our dreaming self. I think that the idea of a wall actually follows something that's been going on for 20, 30, 40 years, which is walling off the dream world. That's, that's uh, really interesting because um, there's a lot of people on the forum right now who have just are in the process of giving up drinking alcohol. And they're very, you know, they're only like a, a month in, into their journey, but they're already starting to realize that many, many moons ago, they sold their authentic self to the devil. And they're just now finding it again at the age of 40, 50, 60. And I think as that continues to happen, people are going to become more in tune to that deeper part of themselves, which they've lost. So if you're listening to this, Lou, and everybody else who's struggling a dream, I just think just keep doing what you're doing. And eventually your dreams in your sleep, as long as you give yourself um, enough time to sleep, uh, you take on board um, the philosophy of what Ruben's been talking about and adapt that to your life. Eventually you'll kind of come out of the other end of this having really good sleep and, and good dreams. Um, one more question before I let you go. Um, the only recurring dream, and this is a personal one for me, I'm being selfish here, folks. When I was uh, a lad, I was a drinker, and um, I probably was in my late teens, maybe 17, 18. I had a recurring dream twice where I was sleeping with a woman who was a friend, so it wasn't a sexual relationship. Each time, it was a different woman. I woke up, the time was the same, pretty sure it was half past two in the morning. I looked at the clock, saw the person next to me, and I was, I was awake. But then I can't move. And then something is at the end of the bed, and it runs up into my face, and I can't describe it. It's almost like it just went, Rah! and then it disappears. I wake up for real, but it's like I've never been asleep that I wasn't dreaming. And that happened twice. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. the hell was going on, Ruben? The, the technical term for that is a, a hypnagogic dream or a hypnagogic hallucination. Um, I think it's a terrible term because it, it, it diminishes the experience. So this is a, not an uncommon experience. And there are a couple of parts to it. Number one, when you wake up and you can't move, um, when we go, when we first go to sleep, we actually cut off the sensory world. We literally close our eyes. We stop hearing with our ears. We stop feeling with our touch senses. So we're no longer getting input from the world. 
in sleep. When we continue on into REM sleep, into dreaming, in addition to cutting off sensory input, we lose motor output. Technically, we become paralyzed when we dream. Mm. That is our voluntary muscles, the muscles we move or speak with. Now, everything important, your heart, your digestion, everything essential is on automatic pilot. You don't have to worry. You breathe, the body's breathing itself. But consciously, if you happen to awaken before that switch is thrown back, you will experience what we call sleep paralysis. Mm. It's something I had, uh, I've had a number of times, so I know what it's like. Um, so the other part of this is when you're sleep paralyzed, your, your, your system, your body is still in the dream, but you're part awake and part dreaming. And so you're in between worlds. And that is um, the, the, the waking world and the dream world are no longer segregated, which we do in our lives and they come together, and it is a breathtaking, it's an astounding, uh, often referred to as, and this is a quote, realer than real world, the, where these two worlds come together. And it can be incredibly beautiful or incredibly frightening. Often there's the appearance of an incubus, this is what you're referring to, there's, there's this dark, and this is across cultures, mm. a frightening image uh, sometimes it's sexual, sometimes it's attacking, sometimes it feels murderous, but it, it feels demonic to people. The hair stands up on the back of your neck. You can't move. This thing is encountering you. There are many, many discussions of this image. And again, science thinks of it as a glitch in the brain. From a, a spiritual, uh, pro spiritual perspective, you're actually in the astral plane. You're encountering a being that's been disembodied. And we don't have much time, but let me just say, a couple of things. Number one, it cannot hurt you. It simply cannot hurt you. And number two, and this is really difficult, but I, I've dealt with this with many, many patients over the years. Um, the, the way we deal with this is we encourage a dialogue. You simply say or you think, <clears throat> it's shadow work. You, you, you talk to the shit. You talk to the demon. Do you know but why? I, in the why? New Testament, there's three places where Jesus encounters demons. And you would think Jesus would say, hey, in the name of the Father, be gone. He doesn't. He's every time he says, he basically says the same thing. He says, come here, come here, sit down, have a cup of tea. Tell me your story. So this is how we deal with darkness as we engage in dialogue. And in my experience with patients is when they, they'll say to this dark figure, who are you? What do you want? You know, mm -hmm. do you want something from me? Uh, you start a dialogue. Mm -hmm. it, it will instantly transform. It will disappear. It will turn into a butterfly. Um, so this is an, it's, it's an act of courage. That's that, that is really good. Cause I, I've been having these issues since I was a child. Um, my most recent one was, um, not that long ago, actually, I, I woke up and there was an, an incubus right next to my bed and, and it was, it's always, uh, a, a, an old lady lately. So, and, so and I, I yeah, suck you, but I jumped so I jumped and, what I do is I jump and I, and I get so terrified. I just hit the light switch and obviously it's gone. So what I do now is I sleep with a sleep mask because I'm afraid <laughs> of bumping into these things. So, so this is a great example. And we call it shadow work. It's, it's, a, it's a deep part of yourself. It's a deep fear. And everybody has this. The essence of shadow work is that we find diamonds in coal. We find the most precious thing buried in a deep, dirty, dark, sooty, scary place. And even with the, the, that feminine incubus, by the way, they're, they're not always frightening. And sometimes they'll just sit there calmly at the end of the bed. Um, sometimes they're actually kind. But, but the, the challenge is to open to a dialogue. Don't run from it. It gains its power from fear, from running away from it. I, I think there's something deeper here as well, Ruben. I'm not going to carry on about it because I know you've got to go. But I think it's something deeper. All my trips, acid, um, smoking marijuana in Amsterdam that, that was just turned into a trip because I was drinking so much. All of my trips have all been negative, scary, terrifying. Yes. Um, and my wife, who I was talking to you about earlier on, all of hers are all nice, <laughs> lovely, wonderful. Mm -hmm. There's something there, Ruben, definitely. Something worth thinking about. about. Yeah. Ruben, that has been absolutely fascinating. I've learned a great deal. I think my, I know my audience are going to get 
a lot out of this. I'll put all your uh, notes to your books and your website and everything. And I know you do a lot of talks around uh, America. I'll get them all on the show notes and um, so people can get in touch with you. I, thank you very much. You know, I, I've written for Huffington Post for some years, so I have about 50 articles available. Mm. And all of this is listed on my website. Lots of free articles that people can access. And of course, books and CDs. Great. Thank you, Ruben. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I, I really enjoyed the conversation.